Okay. So this is 616. This is the second lecture of the test block three. We're gonna finish up buoyancy. Uh, what we're gonna do first is continue on, really just go over what uh, I talked about at the end of the lecture yesterday, is that you have a rotating bar, that's the pivot point, that's a certain distance, or that's a string, and I need to know the tension on that string. This is the height y, this is length r1, and that is length r2. Currently hanging from the end is a mass, which we'll just call M. The bar is massless, the string is massless, it's all good. Now, the question, how to get tension. This is a hybrid problem. It involves rotation and a little bit of uh, vectors. To simplify this, uh, what I've done is I'm going to draw the forces necessary to the rotation of the bar. You have Ty acting vertically at a distance of R1, and then you have a force down of Mg at a distance of R2. Now that's the first part. It's a torque problem. If I told you there's no rotation, you know uh, the only, I give you M, you know G, R1, and R2, so the only unknown is that in this is T sub Y, and I say, well tell me what T sub Y is. And you know that it's not rotating. Sum of the torques is equal to zero. So T, Y, R1, and M, G, R2. Those are our two forces. Those are the two distances. So we have two torques. The next question is, are they positive or minus? In both cases, they're to the right. TY is up, it's out, so it's positive. MGR2 is to the right, but its force is down into the page or negative. So we get this, solve for TY. MGR2 is equal to TYR1. So MGR2 over R1 is equal to TY. So that is the value TY. And what I would do at this point is, given all that other information, I would plug in the numbers at that time and get a value for TY. So now you know what the tension of Y is. The second part of the problem is the fact that this tension The TY and the TX look like this. Now the way that I do this, TX plus TY is equal to the total tension, like we're adding vectors. So I'm going to draw this tip to tail so I can move TX up here. So TY plus TX gives me that tension. And that tension is what I'm looking for. This particular length is y, that particular length is r1, which means that this angle theta is the inverse tan of Tx over Ty. But you can't really get that. All you got is TY. You don't have TX. So you can't really get theta. But another thing that you can do is you can also say that theta is the inverse tan of Y over R1. That those links there are directly proportional to or have the same proportions as TX and TY. So you can get that theta. 
this theta, you then understand that that theta and that theta are the same. Those are the same angles. If you've got two parallel lines with a line cutting across, those angles are equal to each other. So sine of theta is ty over t, that the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse is that tension. So t is ty over sine of theta. And so that's how you would get it. Now the numbers, you can use the set of numbers that are listed in problem set uh, seven and by the way, problem set eight is now on the table and will be posted online shortly. Um, one of the things that we did to be mean, and so now I'm just gonna give it a minute so that everybody gets these notes because I'm gonna draw over it, is how would it change if I dunked that tank in water. Now, if you had, so now I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about this part and then I'm gonna rework the problem or adjust the, um, the parts of this. If you had a mass hanging from a string and I said, it's in the air, what's the tension? You go, well, that's easy. I've got tension up. I've got mg down. I know that the object is not moving. So it is in translational equilibrium. So T minus mg is equal to zero and tension is equal to mg. But now we dunk this thing in water. Now the object is sitting in water, it has a new tension, T prime. The forces are a little bit different. You've got T prime up. Well, that's kind of like T from before. You've got MG down like before, but now there's an F B up that there is an additional force wandering around in there, the, bo uh, the buoyant force. So let's sum the forces. Once again, nothing's changing. The sum of the forces in Y is zero, and by not changing, I meant um, it's not moving up or down. And you draw those forces, T prime, buoyant force and mg. So I can solve for T prime mg minus fb and this becomes mg minus rho of the fluid being displaced, water, the volume of the object and then G. In this particular case, uh, I made a correction at the end of problem set seven that the object sitting in this tank is aluminum. In this particular case, I'm doing this generically, so it has a density rho, and I would have to give you that. I, if I give you the mass and I give you rho, you don't need the volume because density is mass divided by volume. So volume is mass divided by density. So this becomes mg minus rho w, mass of whatever object that is hanging, divided by the density of the object, and then gravity. And then this is the new tension. All of these numbers are positive. The original tension was mg. You subtract from it this amount. So T prime is less than T. It's 
So you can now show that the object gets lighter. There is the buoyant force. So how does this change? You have a new T prime, and what I would do is I would look at that problem. I give you the mass, you know gravity, the density of water, you can figure it out, or you just know it's a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. You know that it is aluminum, so I would go and look up aluminum at, um, and actually, let's just look up aluminum. Twenty seven hundred twenty seven hundred kilograms per cubic meter, and I'd plug everything in, and then I would get a new T prime. That T prime is mg or is substituted for mg initially when the object was just hanging it was tension or mg now it's t prime so what you would do is you have t prime that you know there r1 and r2 you have TY pulling up. You sum the torques. And then you solve for TY. By reducing this to T prime, TY decreases. You get a smaller value. And then when you have TY, you just follow this solution and then the whole thing goes over. So basically what I did is the first time I ran through it, the object was simply hanging. This tension at the end of the rope or at the end of the pole was simply mg. Now it's T prime, T prime being this the tension after you take into consideration buoyant force. And then it just propagates through the rest of the problem as is. The change in T prime changes T Y, the change in T Y changes T. So the tension in the string when it's out of water should be greater than the tension of the string when the mass is in water. So you should find it out, um, find that out. I would go through it both ways. Find out the tension of the string when it's just a mass hanging there, and the other time I would find the tension of the string if it was just sitting there in water. So that, this introduces the whole idea of hybrid problems where this involved vectors of fluids and torque. Now one of the things that um, occasionally I get people asking about it is why did we not consider Tx when adding up the torques to solve for T? Because Tx is there definitely, Ty is there. The main reason is that T 
Tx is only acting parallel to the axis. Think about this. If we were looking down at uh, that bar and we looked at the various forces, the forces of the wire, the Ty is this vertical force, that force that can move the bar. Tx is the force pushing directly on the door into the wall. Can that force Tx cause this door to open? No. Only the perpendicular forces to the bar have a contribution. You can push on this door all day and it won't open if you're pushing it like this. This is that perpendicular portion, the Ty, is the part that contributes. Mm -hmm. How likely would we be for a higher from the architect? Metaphysically certain. <laughs> 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 it um, problems like this now really with um, with test one that was an introduction. With test two we were making things a little bit harder, and we've got a depth certain depth of tools. Test three, now I'm going to start pulling in things together. With test three, the, um, the intent is I'm going to try to keep the hybrid problems within test three material, like sound and fluids. Um, this is one of the reasons why I kind of introduced, or I, I'm still reviewing torque and forces and vectors, because I want that in my toolkit when I write test three. But when I write the final, that covers material of one, two, and three, and I can do anything with that. And so that, that gives me a lot more ability to have fun and express myself. So you think you can make three to be better you have a hybrid problem? You will have a hybrid problem about what and which in which combination, I don't know. So like, with your problem, you will not have project formula. I will work really hard not to make that mistake again. And I, I don't really consider it that much of a mistake, but the, that's another talk. But I, I promise you, I'm gonna work very hard to make sure that this is happening. The thing, um, I make mistakes. I really do, I make mistakes all the time. I just don't make the same mistake twice. I'm pretty sure I'll screw up in another one. But not that one. <laughs> now, what we're going to go over is just as I have had or I have talked about my favorite equation, one could then ask, well, what's your least favorite equation? And my least favorite equation is this. It is Bernoulli's equation. It goes over, it talks, of, it, it has a major contribution in fluids, in moving fluids. The first example that we're going to do is you have a pipe. Let's say the area at the top of the pipe is uh, one square meter. And at the bottom of the pipe, the area is 0 0.8 square meters. The hill. is 20 meters so it's going to fall from a height of 20 meters down and I want to know if the initial velocity was 10 meters per second at a pressure of uh, two atmospheres what is the final velocity and what is the final pressure. So we have a pipe at a particular velocity. It has an area. It goes 
down the hill. So it's going to change its velocity and it's going to change its pressure. And for this, we need Bernoulli's equation. And the equation that we really need to use first. So I'm going to keep Bernoulli's equation away for just a moment and talk about the equation of continuity. The equation of continuity is a very fancy schmancy phrase for a simple idea. The flow going in is equal to the flow going out. Which means that if you have 10 gallons per second going into a pipe, you got to have 10 gallons per second coming out. So I typically call it conservation of flow. Conservation of flow. Flow is area times velocity. And it has the units of cubic meters per second. The equation of continuity, therefore, is A1V1 is equal to A2V2. Uh-oh, I hit the... <sighs> So flow area or area times velocity. Now one of the things that we can get through um, through this is that the total volume, say you had a pipe uh, velocity is five meters per second and the area of the pipe is 0 0.2 square meters. How? much water comes out of the pipe in 30 seconds. The total volume, you could say, is the flow or flow rate, a lot of times people say, multiplied by time. So A V T. So when you multiply the flow by the total time, you can get the total volume of fluid coming out. So this is 0 0.2 times 5 times 30. 150 times 0 0.2. Oh, actually, it just cancels out 30 cubic meters. And so we get 30 cubic meters out of this. So the equation of continuity can be used to determine the total volume passed out given the time. And now the equation of continuity can say it can determine the velocity of fluids coming out of changing area pipes. Now, just looking at the equation of continuity, a simple example that we could do is uh, water comes out of a hose at 2 meters per second. You cover half the whole, what happens? So you're in your backyard, you've got a hose, the water's just coming out of it, you put your thumb over half the opening of the hose, what happens to the water? It comes out faster, the velocity increases. So 
A1, V1 is equal to A1 over 2, V2. I said that the area, the new area is the half of the old area. Those cancel, and 2V1 is equal to V2, which is 2 times 2, or 4 meters per second. So by putting your finger over the hose, you've changed the area that it can come out of. There's still a finite amount of water going into that hose from the house. That same amount has to come out of that hose on the other end. You've closed half the area, so the velocity is gonna shoot out faster. Now let's talk about this problem, Bernoulli's equation. It, uh, or this part. When you deal with a problem like this, it's among the easiest of the problems. It should be something that you guys get excited about because um, it's a plug and chucker's dream. The first thing you do is attack it with the equation of continuity. If I give you area and velocity at the top and I give you area at the bottom, immediately V2 should be solvable or is solvable, not should. So A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2. So V2 is A1, V1 over A2. A1 is one, V1 is 10, A2 is 0 0.8. So that gives me a velocity of 12.5. So the velocity has increased slightly. Now let me introduce you to Bernoulli's equation. The reason why I don't like it is just because it's so doggone long. In Bernoulli's equation, what this equation does is it deals with the pressure of certain fluids in relationship to its vertical position and its velocity. Now the fluid in the pipe is water, so all the rows will be 1,000. What I typically do in problems like this I set the origin of the height to be the lowest point of the problem. So if the lowest point is the origin, H2 is zero and H1 is 20 meters or just simply H. So at the very beginning, I could at least zero out one of the values. The whole problem now is determining what P2 is and we get it by doing this. So that's the equation that we need to solve. There is, yes. Can you explain why you set that zero? So H1 and H2 are the heights of these points. Now we could be in Denver where this height is 5,000 and that height is 5,020, or we could be at surface level or at sea level where that height is zero and that height is 20. All I really care about actually is the difference between the two. So that's why I set the lowest point to be zero. So H2 is equal to zero. Had it gone up, I would have set H1 is equal to zero. I'm trying to keep my numbers positive, yes. 
And once again, it's because negative numbers are shifty and can't be trusted. Just I like everything positive, really. Um, so that means H1 is 20. If it, the hill went up, then H1 would be 0 and H2 is 20. Those are the two potential ways. It doesn't, re it, I mean, could you set one at uh, 500 meters and the other one at 520? Yes. But when you pushed one over, you would still get that difference of 20 and then it, it really wouldn't matter. Now for this portion, you got to be careful about this. When we usually talk about pressure, the units that we typically use are in atmospheres. And we have to be careful about, one of the things you guys got to do is, and it is a valid question to ask, what units for your final answer do you want this in? And I could give you one of two choices. Either A, atmospheres, or B, newtons per meter squared. Those are the two. If you looked at rho GH and one half rho V squared, they both have units of density, kilograms, meters cubed. In the first part, there's green, or I'm sorry, gravity, meters per second squared, and height, meters. I'm going to cancel one of the meters and do some rearranging, and that leaves me with kilograms, meters per second squared, times one over meters squared. That's a force. That's newtons, and that's meters squared. And you could do the same thing for rho v squared. You can get newtons per meter squared for both. In this particular problem, I gave you the initial pressure in atmospheres, which begs the question, what form of answer do I want at the end? And let's just go atmospheres. I have this problem set up so that that is in atmospheres and those are in newtons per meter squared and I want my final pressure to be atmospheres. This is where you have to be careful. You cannot add atmospheres to newtons per meter squared. You will get the wrong answer. So what you have to do is convert If P2 must be in atmospheres, you take P1 and you divide by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. So in this particular case, I did give you that value. So this is 2, 1,000, 10, 20, 1 half, 1,000. Uh, what's my V1? Uh, 10 squared plus one half, 1,000, 12.5 squared. In fact, uh, there is an error in this equation. Where's my error? There should be a minus sign, where? The one half, this one. So that should be minus, and that should be minus. And you guys should be so happy. There's so many numbers there. 
so many numbers to plug and chug. Um, and I get 2.7 atmospheres. And so that would be the answer. I'm gonna just write out the equation. I'm not gonna solve for it because we'd end up with the equivalent of this. If I ask for Newtons per meter squared for P2, what I would do is take P1 and multiply it by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth, and then add it to rho g h1 plus one half rho v1 squared minus one half rho v2 squared. And I'd basically get whatever that is multiplied by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. So you need be very careful with your units. This problem, if it shows up on a test, one of its primary functions is to see if you're paying attention to the difference between atmospheres and newtons per meter squared and when they're used within Bernoulli's equation. My opinion is the Bernoulli's equation is an appetizer problem. Um, it's, you look at that and you go, oh, quit whining. Um, it's just setting up that equation, solve for V2. Set up that equation, solve for P2. Done. Pay attention to your units. It's like two, three lines of algebra, tops. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, it will be in the equation sheet. I will give you, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. But when you did that, that one time, I'll give you that. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna get, this is not organic chemistry. I wouldn't expect you to memorize all these dumb things, but the ideas behind them, I want you to understand. Like, given this type of problem, what equations do you pull out off of that equation sheet? Bernoulli's equation can be used in several different ways, and one of the ways that I like to talk about it, in a way that you experience something like this that uses Bernoulli's equation almost every day. And what I'm gonna talk about is, I am going to answer the question why does that infernal shower curtain attack me whenever I turn on the shower? You could blame Bernoulli. It's his fault. Looking from above, this is your shower curtain, and I have two points. P, um, well, there's a pressure one and a pressure two, and those pressures are immediately inside the shower curtain, governed by the fact that there's my shower and there's wind. When you first turn on that shower, wind suddenly rushes by as all the water gets pushed into the, um, the, the shower stall. From the side view, the two points that are, I'm studying are both at the same height. So H1 and H2 are equal to each other. If I, I mean, think of the sheet, the two points are right there up against each other with only the shower curtain in between. So H1 is equal to H2. Inside the shower curtain, there's a wind, V1. And on the outside, V2, there is no wind. 
the air in your bathroom outside the shower stall is effectively zero. I mean, little bits of, of air just bubbling around, but it's overall, it's, its velocity is zero. Well, let's look at Bernoulli's equation. And I get this. H1 is equal to H2. So those go away. V2 is equal to zero. They go away. And once again, it, it illustrates the point that yes, zero is my favorite number. So I'm left with P1 plus one half row V1 squared is equal to P2. Or as I like to draw it, P1 is equal to P2 minus one half row V1 squared. That's the equation that I want to look at. And in this particular problem, I'm not interested in the numbers. What I'm interested in is I've set up an inequality. What is the relationship of P1 to P2? Is P1 bigger than P2? Is P1 equal to P2? Is P1 less than P2? You're telling me that P1 would be greater than P2? Say it with conviction. Fill the room. It will be greater. So you said it will be greater and you filled the room with your ignorance. If you've got a number and you subtract from it a number, you're going to get a smaller number. Think about the relationships of these numbers. I don't think less of her. She filled the room with her confidence while you said nothing. So, I think better of her. So, <laughs> then you. So, with, when you've got five and you subtract from it one and you've got four, that number is less than the earlier number. That's why I tend to, to write it like this, because I think the inequality becomes a little bit more apparent. So P1 is less than P2. It has to be, which means that that is a lower pressure system. That is a higher pressure system. And what happens when you have a high pressure and a low pressure? you have force or wind. So what is happening is that it's gonna try to equalize the pressure by, well, there's a net, due to the air moving on the inside, there is a net force differential on the shower curtain, which is always towards you, that nasty, filthy, come on, all it costs is a buck and a half at Walmart to replace, nasty shower curtain. And so that's why it comes at you. Yes? I just have a quick question. Okay, so when you cross out the H's, is it just because they're equal to each other? Correct. And these, they're equal to each other and cancel. That one is zero. So that's why. Yes? And really quick, just so that I understand. 5, 10, 15, 20, 24. Take out, a, just her, take out a sheet of paper, put your name, student ID on it, start handing it around to everybody. Before you leave, make sure you sign that. Now, to the people watching at home, and yes, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I don't punish people for not t for not showing up. But you still reward the ones who do. <laughs> exactly. I don't know how it's going to happen. Typically, I just get the name. And really, at the um, there's a lot of stuff at the end of the semester, the the sausage making, if you will, 
what we're doing is we're getting a bit of sausage that we're gonna make the rest of the sausage with. So, so to all those people on the beach, I hope it's worth it. So, um, now what we're gonna do is there's two major uh, regions of knowledge that we gotta cover. Um, the first of which is oscillations. So we're kind of shifting gears a little bit. With oscillations, we're talking about like pendulum. We're talking about rhythmic motions. Um, the biggest, the one that most everybody knows about, um, everybody has to have had at one point either a grandfather or a grandmother clock with those big pendula that swing side to side. And the one thing that you notice is that pendula swings back and forth on a regular basis. Just back and forth, back and forth. Those are simple pendula or pendulum, pendula. We don't go big into uh, pendula. So a simple pendula is you've got a mass at the end of a uh, length of string or a stick and that thing oscillates back and forth one back and forth is equal to one oscillation so when it goes back and forth one back and forth two there's also, and there's gravity, obviously. There's also spring pendulum or pendula. Spring pendula are, you've got a spring, you've got a mass, the mass, the spring constant, and it goes, like if this is the rest position, it goes out, it comes back, it gets uh, compressed, and it expands. So this is a uh, neutral position, uh, stretch position, back to neutral, compressed position, and back. And that is one oscillation. And we're going to kind of talk about what you guys need to do in lab. And real quick, just so I know, what lab are you doing on Monday? The what? Is there a lab on Monday? Okay. I'm trying to figure out if it's... Um, do you know the name of it? Archimedes. Aren't you doing Archimedes? Okay. That's the whole buoyant force thing. We've pretty much covered everything we need to do with that. Um, the TA is also like that um, gold and aluminum one cubic meter at the bottom of the ocean problem for buoyant force. Um, so simple pendula and spring pendula, and those are the two that we're gonna look at. The simple pendulum has a period of two pi square root L over G, and the spring pendulum has a period of 2 pi M over K. And this is something that we really need to slow down and focus on. In terms of quantities, that are independent and quantities that are dependent. The period is dependent on certain things and the pendulums are period are independent of certain things. For a simple pendula, you look at it and you go, it is dependent on L 
and G. A simple pendulum is length dependent and gravity dependent. But its period is mass independent. So if you were in a, now granted with air, um, air with wind drag, it would, it would slow down eventually, but effectively you could have a mouse at the end of the string, or you could have just a thousand pound, uh, uranium pellet or lead pellet just sitting there. And both of them, if they're at the same length would, would, uh, go back and forth at the same rate. For spring pendulums, it is dependent on mass and spring constant. And it's independent of gravity. And what I've introduced is the idea of a lot of different multiple choice questions. So as an example, just thinking about these equations, you have a simple pendulum. I double the length of the pendulum. Does the pendulum period increase, decrease, or remain the same if I increase L? If L goes up, what happens to T? It, would? it goes up. Now, why would you say that it would decrease? Let's investigate that inaccuracy. If you can't set an example, at least you could be a warning to others. If that goes up, T has to go up. Why would you think that? If the numerator increases on a number, that number must increase as well. Isn't L for length? Yes. I just thought that if the length would increase, that tension would decrease. Okay, let's, let's, this is not tension here. That T is not tension. That, that capital T is period. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, if I increase gravity, what happens to the period of the pendulum? You may now say the answer that you gave in the proof. It decreases. Because if you increase the number in a denominator, the overall number goes down. That is the core of a lot of multiple choice questions on test three. Given a simple pendulum, I quadruple the length. Quadruple the length. What happens to the period? It goes up. Can you quantify what number it increases by if I quadruple the length? It goes what? 64? 16? No, but now you're just trying to stab in the dark. If, and this is another valid question that I will ask on the multiple choice. If L prime, or I'm sorry, uh, L prime is 4L, what happens to the period? So period prime is 2 pi L prime over G. And you substitute 2 pi 4L over G. I'll do an extra step just to show what I'm doing. You can separate that to this. This becomes 2 times 2 pi L over G, which is 2 times the period. So if you quadruple the length, if you quadruple the numerator, you double the period. If you quadrupled gravity, you would cut the period by one fourth. Again? 
if you quadrupled gravity, or I'm sorry, you wouldn't cut it by one uh, fourth. If you quadruple the gravity, you would cut the period in half. And another thing that we could talk about is frequency is the inverse of period. So frequency is one over two pi G over L. because frequency is inverse of period. If G increases, frequency increases. If L increases, frequency decreases because it's the opposite. When I was, um, and now for something, just to keep track of everything. Now granted, you will be given um, the, these equations on the um, the worksheet for the test or the equation sheet but a lot of times you could sit there and go is T square root of L over G or G over L a lot of times I go is it is it G over L or L over G I'm never quite sure one of the things that I've tried to teach you is understanding the units and how they work. What unit should you get from period? Inverse seconds. Seconds, correct. Inverse seconds would be for what? Frequency. Frequency, yes. Good. So let's do the units. Let's do units the wrong way first and try square root of G over L. G is in meters per second squared. L is in meters. That leaves me with the square root of one over second squared or one over seconds. So really what we found is if you've got G over L, you've got a frequency. So it's gotta be L over G. L meters, G, meters per second squared those cancel seconds is in the denominator of the denominator it gets kicked up to the numerator and you get seconds so you don't so you could sit there and do a quick uh unit check and everything will be fine Now, with the, um, let's see, gauging my time and the desire to end class a little early. Uh, boo, 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 boo. Let's talk about the lab. The lab that you guys are going to do on uh, Tuesday. You're going to confirm spring constant K, and you're going to confirm G is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. You're going to do those two things. If you have a, um, yeah, in the first part, you're going to use a spring. And you're going to use the same spring, so. You're going to use it two different ways. 
The first thing we're going to do is use it in the conventional way of measuring its spring constant. You're going to have a spring and you're going to have it in a, this is the unstretched no mass position and then you put a little bit of mass m1 and then you put on more mass m2 and then you put on more mass m3 and it stretches x1 x2 and x3 so it's going to stretch every time you add a little bit of mass on it it's going to stretch a little bit more and you're going to measure that change in vertical position when it comes to this so you're going to have a um you're going to have a list of masses and you're going to have a list of displacements. Now with the mass, you're going to have a certain number of forces. And so you're going to plot F and X. So you're going to have, you mark the zero, zero, and then you mark that, and that, and that, and that. And the computer, you will tell it, fit a line. It will give you a slope. So you're gonna fit this line and you're gonna get a slope. Some M is gonna give you, you're gonna get an M for that value. Now this particular M, I'll just say M slope to differentiate it from M1, M2, and M3, which are the masses. You know that the equation for Hooke's Law in terms of the magnitudes is just F equals KX. Compare it with the linear equation y equals mx. So f the force is related to y. The displacement x is the x in the math, which means that we have a value of uh, the de the value of force, which is k. So if F is associated with Y and X is associated with X, the value of the slope is the spring constant itself. So you're going to fit that and out pops K. Now, another way that they could do this, I forget which way they do it. Um, some of them have this plotted, X and F. If they do this, you still fit that line, but F equals KX, and what I do is I change it and I say X is 1 over k f.
Some, it depends on how they want it. Some of them want X on the vertical, some want an X on the horizontal. I don't particularly mind either way. But when you look at your linear equation, Y equals MX, in the lab world, we have X, F, and something else dealing with K. In math, if they tell you that X is your vertical, then X is the Y value in Y equals MX. F becomes the X value in math. And then the slope of the line is that, so it becomes 1 over K. So M becomes 1 over K, or the spring constant is the inverse of the slope. So you could do it one of two different ways. If they tell you put force on the vertical, great, spring constant is the slope. If they say X is the vertical, you go, doesn't matter, I'm on it. Slope is the inverse. It could be done either way, it doesn't matter. But it's still a linear fit. Now, this gives you the value of K, which then gets us to the point where um, I got to talk about something briefly. Give me both words that you use when you see the letter K. What am I talking about? The blank blank. Spring constant. What is the value of constant? Just take a stab at it. Don't look at me like just. What are you going to be? An optometrist. So you're going to look at like my eyes. And so if I go, well, what's wrong with me, doctor? Why am I going blind? You're just going to go. Well, I think it's going to be. No, I don't want an optometrist like that. I want an optometrist who goes, this is what's wrong. I'm going to fix it. And then give me some painkillers. It's just, but that's unrelated. Um, so, spring constant, constant, does a constant change? No, that would be a dumb name to call something that changes and then say it's a constant. So if I say the spring constant is, we do this experiment here on Earth, and I determine that the spring constant is 200 newtons per meter, and I take that spring to the moon. We go as a class, we'll do it as a field trip. Now the first thing I'd let everybody do is just run around on the surface of the moon because dude, we're on the moon. Let's, let's have some fun. But the other thing that I would do eventually is say, well, what's the spring constant of the spring now? I just took it to the moon, Earth's gravity is one-sixth that of Earth. Does the spring constant change? No, because it's a constant. So, and also, getting back to the spring constant back here, there's no gravity dependence in this. The spring, and materially, the spring doesn't care about gravity. All it cares about is the displacement the mass has with itself. So if you measure it to be 200 newtons per meter on the moon, it's the same 200 on Earth, on Mars, in space. It's the same thing. What you do next after doing these, um, these fits is you're gonna start doing the bouncy, bouncy, bouncy thing. You're gonna have number of oscillations, total time, and period. And you're gonna sit there and bounce that thing with, um, several different masses and you're going to get a list
they typically want you to, to do 20 oscillations and you pull it down and you let it go up, down one, up, down two, up, down three, and you get it to 20 and you measure that time. That period is just the number of oscillations divided by the total time. The reason why they have you measure 20 oscillations in its time, so take the total time and divide by 20, is that it minimizes the error involved. If, you're, if you try to measure the period of one oscillation, the time, up, down, uh, click, if you're off by a quarter of a second and the period is um, two seconds, that's a significant error. If you let it bounce up and down 20 times and then on that last one you're off by a quarter of a second, that quarter of a second error is distributed amongst 20 oscillations. So it's 1 20th of that error and it's kind of reduced. And then you, then you put all the masses. Well, you know that the period is 2 pi m over k. And the whole game in this is to find k and compare with with this these k's over here. It's the same spring, you should get the same answer. So how do you do this? Well, you're going to plot not m and period, but you're going to plot m and period squared. If you plot if you plot uh, m and period, it's going to get something like that. It's going to curve. And you can't get a linear fit off a curve. But if you plot period squared and m, you're going to get a linear fit. And I'll show you how. Period squared is equal to 2 pi squared m over k. Rearranging this, period squared is 4 pi squared over k times m. So I've just squared it and I've rearranged it. Now it's a situation where if I double m, I double the value of t squared. You treat t squared like it's a just a, a regular variable. If you compare it to y equals m slope x, y is the period squared. Y are those period squared values. x is the mass being suspended. And then m slope is equal to 4 pi squared over k. So you take that fitted line and what you do is you take 4 pi squared and divide it by m slope and then you've got the value of the spring constant. And this spring constant should be the same as the spring constant that you solved when doing this or doing that whenever whatever they ask you to do. So remember spring constant that k does not change it's a constant. Um, remember that sometimes we have to do weird things like square values in order to get a linear fit to it. Remember that we have to take the total time of 
a great number of oscillations to minimize the error that we introduce by not getting the time quite right. So there's a lot of different things that we learn from this. The other one, the simple pendulum, what you're going to do is you're going to have that simple pendulum on a short length and then you're going to increase the length and do the same thing, increase the length some more and do the same thing, increase the length some more and do the same thing. And one of the things that they may do is just use two different masses and you can keep the door open when you open it. Um, use two different masses and um, show that the, the simple pendulum will not change its, its period. But when you change its length, it will. So you're gonna have um, a length that you're gonna set up. You're gonna have a uh, number of oscillations. You're gonna have the total time. You're gonna have the period and then you're gonna have the period squared. And you're gonna set those up. So you're gonna let it hang 20 centimeters with the mass, let it rock back and forth 20 times, measure the total time. Then you're gonna increase the length probably by 10 or 20 centimeters, and you keep doing that until you have four or five different sets of data. Then what you do is you plot period squared and L. And you're gonna get these points. And so you're gonna get a value for M, the slope out of this. Well, let's take a look at our equation that we have period equals 2 pi L over G. When we square it, it's 4 pi squared over G times L. When you compare it to the equation or the line, linear equation, Y equals MS, that slope M is equal to 4 pi squared over G and g is 4 pi squared over m. And that should be equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. So you do the same thing in terms of squaring period in order to get um, gravity. And so those are, that's effectively what you're going to do on the lab on Tuesday, I think. Tuesday's a lab day. Oh, let's see. Eh, 15 more minutes and then we'll be fine. So let's do, um, let's do this. Uh, think of a problem. So you have a spring. That spring from its rest position on earth that X is 2 meters and that mass is uh, 50 kilograms. So you have a spring, it's hanging in gravity. The mass at the end of the spring is 50 kilograms. Its stretch distance is two meters. The question is, how long will it take to oscillate 
uh, 30 times. So we're going to want the total time t. Period is total time divided by the number of oscillations. I know that the period of a spring pendulum is 2 pi m over k. And I also know that I'm dealing with a spring, so f is equal to kx, the magnitude version of Hooke's law. I also know that it's hanging, which means I've got to find the sum of the forces in y, which is equal to zero. The forces in the hanging non-oscillation position means that force of the spring is up and the force of gravity is down. So positive kx minus mg. So mg is equal to kx and mg over x is equal to k. And just for uh, the knowledge of, well, what, how much is the spring, uh, what's the value of uh, k? M is 50, G is 10, X is 2, which means the spring constant is 250 newtons per meter. So if I just, if I just gave you a spring hanging there by 2 meters and the mass is 50 kilograms, you could easily figure out what the spring constant is. Now for the second part. How long will it take to oscillate 30 times? The period is total time divided by N. So total time divided by N is equal to 2 pi square root of M over K. I'm looking for the total time. Total time, 2 pi N square root m over k. So 2 pi 30 m 50 250. So the total time I get 84.3 seconds. And I could do all sorts of things. If I wanted just, well, what's the period? Total time divided by 30. I get 2.81 seconds. If I wanted frequency, I would just inverse that period. And I would get... 0 0.36 hertz. So that's a simple question. Another simple question with a very simple answer is, uh, what's the period of this system if I take it into space where there is no gravity? I appreciate your answer. You're fairly consistent. Consistently wrong, that is. It's the same, <laughs> it's the same yes. Once again, question back to you. I give you a chance to, to regroup and, and rise above it. Is, uh, is a spring gravity dependent for its period? No. Correct. It is not gravity dependent. So the period in space is the same as the period on Earth, the moon, in France, um, in Starkville, any of those places, the spring constant would remain the same. Getting to another example, we could do, um, in this case, we are eventually going to go to the moon. We have a, um, a simple pendulum and it has a mass at the end of the string. It oscillates uh, 50 times in um, 
150 seconds. I'm on Earth. What is the length? Now, one of the first trick questions that I'm going to ask that has a very obvious answer is, if I double the mass of the pendulum, what's going to happen to the period? Do I need to know the mass of the pendulum? No. Simple pendula are mass independent. Double the mass does nothing to the period. I know that total time divided by the number of oscillations is period, and that period is 2 pi times the square root of L over G. I need to find what L is. Period, little t over big N, is 2 pi square root of L over G. Square it, t squared, n squared, 4 pi squared, L over G. Solve for L, G T squared over 4 pi squared N squared is equal to L. And that will give me the length. G is 10, T is 150, 4 pi squared N is 50 squared. and I get 2.28 meters. So another simple question with a very simple answer. If I take this pendulum and I just go into space, I go to the International Space Station, where gravity is zero, will the thing work? No, because there's no, you need gravity. It is gravity dependent. But if we go on the moon, the gravity of moon is traditional gravity divided by six, or 10 sixths meters per second per second. How long will it now take to oscillate 50 times. So on Earth, it would take 150 seconds. On the Moon, it's going to do something different. Why? Because simple pendula are gravity dependent. So period is still 2 pi L over G, now G of the Moon. I know that period is t over n, so t over n is equal to 2 pi L over gm. I'm looking for total time, so total time is 2 pi n square root L over gm. Plugging in 2 pi 50, I now have L. 2.28 divided by 10 sixths, 10 sixths, and that gives me 367 seconds.
And so that's the time. So it more than doubled. try to kill three or four minutes and then we're done. All right. So there's going to be, we'll look at, uh, one of the things that I'll do this afternoon is I'll also, um, upload copies of test three. Yes. How is the gravity of the moon still small? There's a six right there. Okay. So gravity of the moon is 10 six, one over gravity of the moon is six tenths so that's where that's where it is um I'm trying to think of one last thing that we can do um i don't know i have nothing left it's friday bring that sheet up front we're done Go home, play in the yard, do something.